Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you had a good lunch break and uh, you have um, eaten well um, because there are some heavy pictures now coming. Uh, so I'm, I'm convinced that you won't fall asleep. And uh, Anita and I, we have sort of just swapped and we think we, we get you stay awake a little bit. Well, thank you first, uh, Kurt Richelmann, for the introduction. Thank you also to Anita Hermannstetter for accepting this presentation, my presentation which refers to an institution that is not a collection of natural or a museum of natural history, but a collection and a museum of medical history. And um, in fact, I would like uh, to take you uh, really uh, virtually a little bit down the road. Uh, you can see we are about here. And you, have, you see that the Museum of Naturkunde has already uh, moved down a little bit too much towards where we are. So uh, I would like for you to follow me about 800 meters on Invalidenstraße, turn left on the, the wonderful Alexander Ufer, and then uh, pay a visit to the Medical History Museum, which is on, located on the premises of the Charité. Well, this museum, um, here you see it from the outside, has been founded in 1899 as a so-called pathological museum. <clears throat> it was founded by the eminent physician, pathologist, anthropologist, and politician Rudolf Virchow, <clears throat> and it reopened after a long time closure following World War II only in 1998 under a new denomination under the label of Berlin Museum of Medical History at the Charité. Since 2007, we present there a varied, a varied spectrum of permanent and temporary exhibition, exhibitions. And since then, art has been as, and is still repeatedly our guest, basically performing in two separate formats. On the one hand, as larger art and medicine shows on our separate temporary exhibition floor, a selection of such projects is indicated here on this slide. On the other hand, um, um, we uh, show art as pointed interventions into our permanent presentation. And today, I would like to take a closer look at the latter, at our art interventions, not so much focusing, though, on the specific art that is shown there, I would rather like to turn our views towards ourselves, towards our own museums, setups, to our very own spaces and ask why art there? What makes it special or better? What would, what could make it special, maybe unique, outstanding, yes, breathtaking and inspiring to intersect with art in the midst of our given museum's displays. Speaking about such art interventions in our institutions, we have to consider a fundamental difference. It became clear in these two days, I know, from difference from usual art presentations in an art gallery, in an art museum, or even in our very own secluded temporary exhibition space. With our interventions, we are not acting in an however shaped white cube, but in a colored cube. In showroom spaces filled already with objects which are thematically arranged there. Our permanent galleries are, previous to the arriving art, worked through conceptually. There is a general pre-existing outline, a storyline, a profile of object-based argumentation, a discursive landscape of matter, materials, and media. In short, our permanent exhibition rooms provide implicitly or explicitly a special narrative, a narrative that frames and structures the visitor's walks, observations, thoughts, emotions, and talks. Any art that is implemented therein is placed to relate to, to converse with, and to communicate with this narrative. In the case of our interventions, this is a big chance, but also quite some challenge. 
Well, these are the topics of my talk. In the first part, I would uh, really want to guide you briefly into the permanent presentation of our museum, at least until we reach the very exhibition room where we mostly uh, show our art interventions, the specimen hall, to outline some general aspects of our basic narrative. Second, I wish to take a closer look at what is uh, shown there at what the specimen hall speaks of, asking what the ob objects shown there do tell, and even more important, what they don't tell. Third, I will address one example of an artist's intervention that in that room that I thought worked quite well, and finally sum up briefly. So let's start, walk over to the Charité and enter the museum from its northern, the Naturkunde Museum site, I may call it so. Let's walk up the third floor where our permanent presentation begins. Here are the outlines of the floor. You see there are basically two larger showrooms. The first one roughly 140 square meters large, the second one 250 square meters. The idea on this floor is to finally lead the visitors into one of the core spheres of 19th century scientific medicine, which is the pathologist's dissecting world and his specimen collection. However, we welcome our guests with a medical space prior to the pathologist's cosmos with a sphere of action from which then, later on, pathologists and their practices moved on in a truly organical way. We start with the anatomical theater in the 18th century. The visitors are invited to take a seat there and make themselves familiar with the anatomical gaze which was cultivated in these anatomical theaters since the 16th century. Our viewers uh, from the 21st century get some glimpses of regular human anatomy from head to toe in a selection of specimens made in different preparation techniques at various times here in Berlin. The underlying implicit question is here, when and how changed this anatomical focus towards a more pathoanatomical perspective, asking in a more systematic way about science, nature, and causes of human disease. These aspects are obviously addressed in the next section of the exhibition called the Anatomical Museum. With around 50 old and very valuable specimens, we can give some answers here. All of these artifacts stem from the privately run Museum Anatomicum of two Berlin anatomists, Johann Gottlieb and Friedrich August Walter. Both father and son addressed their utmost interest and attention between 15, excuse me, between 1756 and 1796 to their collection of body stones and sick bones. The, th the third section, the third niche of this ex exhibition floor is already leading into the center of Rudolf Virchow's medical thinking and acting. Virchow received his training as a, pathologist in, as a pathologist in Berlin, and between 1856 and 1901, he ran the most influential institute of pathology on the premises of the Charité. He sat at this desk where he developed his cellular model of the human organism and where he always, as if he would just have to stand up and turn around, had in his background available for teaching and public education, this his very own creation, a huge specimen collection. The artifacts of this pathological collection finally formed the then so-called pathological museum in the same museum building where today our visitors, if they turn around from Virchow's desk, find at least one showroom that resembles the original displays to some degree our historical specimen hall. Looking and finally walking into this room, one faces the master himself, Virchow's portrait as a marble bust on a slim but solid base. From a distance, the bust seems framed 
with a kind of halo, you can hardly see that in the distance, with kind of a halo by the blow up of a brain cell depiction from Virchius Opus Magnum, his cellular pathology from 1856. Let's walk into this hall and take a closer look at the main objects presented there. In the original showcases, by the way, these are copies of the, uh, from the Berlin Naturkunde Museum that was 10 years older. Some 650 dry and wet specimens are permanently on display. Each front of a showcase is addressed to a specific organ or bodily structure, brain, heart, liver, lung, and so on. Plus, there is always a digression from normal anatomy to special pathology addressed by various specimens in greater depth. So, the visitor gets it all. A view beneath the skin, organs in great number, atomical, anatomical morphologies, specific pathologies, multiples and multiple diseases, cancer, bleeding, inflammation, malformations, sometimes even sign of treatment and cure, and the prostheses are on display, and even some pacemakers made it into the showcases. They get it all. Really? All and everything? What actually do they see? What actually do you see in these odd specimens? First of all, our visitors might Yes, they might recognize that these items here are real brains. They might understand from looking at it what side of the brain is turned to them. And some might even find the zone of medical interest, the pathological alteration. That is all. That is all that they can see here in these very objects. What these objects do not show and do not tell is what was the cause of the respective disease? How did it develop in the organ, in the very organism of, the, of a human individual? Did it spread where and how, like in the case of cancer, for example? But also, who was the person to whom the organ belonged? Where did he or she come from and how did the person live? When was the disease detected in what stage of life and how? How was he or she treated? And how did the individual manage to live at least some time with the shown disease? How did he or she suffer and finally die? What about the social context? How did relatives, peers, neighbors, etc. react to the suffering and, and finally dying person? What were the cultural, political, implications, conditions under which the person had to deal with his or her disease. Questions, questions over questions to which all these specimens in our showcases provide no answer. They keep quiet. In short, our displays here offer a highly condensed narrative. This narrative seems so focused and profiled that one may get the impression that overall really only very little is said, at least nothing about living, suffering, aching and dying. No sounds, no cries, no smells. All is silent, conserved, like in an aquarium of arrested still lives. Our obvious diagnosis is here, something is missing. In fact, a lot is missing here, at least the whole world aside the mere tissues of the assembled organs. This finding, however, should not drive us into deep depression. On the contrary, each narrative, also our museum's one, is and has to be necessarily exclusive. The more profiled it is, the clearer it gets, the more aspects are usually cut off and are thus missing. And now, at this point, other views. In our case, artists' perspectives can come into play. Good artists' interventions, that was our uh, experience, good artists' interventions here generate a substantially greater picture. 
They do not simply add in a mimetic mode what is already there, but address what is missing by opening complementary views and horizons. Thus, they necessarily challenge, comment, and sometimes provocatively criticize the storyline in the given presentations. In the best cases, this greater picture leads to discussions and debates, joint discussions and debates beyond what is usually on display in our permanent presentation. Let me now give you a brief example of an art intervention which I think worked quite well in this room. In the year 2010, we presented works of the then in Berlin uh, living artist Rainer Maria Matusik. The title of his show was Beyond Humans. In between the showcases of, uh, of the specimen room, Matusik had placed quite a number of randomly shaped wax works tinted in fleshly skin color. The title of these works was just, were just wax models. Very vaguely, these pieces of art mirrored some formations of the specimens in their spacious neighborhood. This, however, was enough to make groups of visitors start immediately to identify the bodily structure from which they thought these works were taken. Matisik, however, had taken the freedom to create free sculptures resembling the materiality of flesh and skin, thus starting a haptic and visual debate on the manipulations and the manipulativity in dealing with shaping and enhancing the body in today's medicine and society. His intervention culminated in a very little, tiny, special, and quite different piece of art, a skin craft that had been taken from the artist's own body and to make it grow. Matisik had given it a specific shape, fixed it, so it did not grow any further and preserved it like one of our very own specimens. He presented it en face our presentations like it was the starting point of a future collection of specimens of free designs. To conclude, talking about art interventions in our museums, I think it is absolutely necessary and worthwhile to reflect upon, upon our own given furbished spaces, our intricate colored cubes the specific showrooms we provide, uh, the narratives we offer there. The more profiled our storylines are, and the sharper our thought through lines of argumentations in our object arrangements are, the greater essential and discursive effect works of art could generate for the visitors there within. What is the challenge here is to bring together on eye level, the two sides, the two positionings. Yes, I may call it the two narratives, our very own uh, thematically based storylines in the museums on the one hand, and what the artists have to address, to indicate, to say on the other side. This means what we seek here is creating kind of sparkles, sparkling cockney and emoti zones that we open, uh, that open our senses, that turn on our feeling, thinking, and perceiving that trigger our debates around and about nature and mankind. And again, where we have to start, and I'm absolutely positive about that, is primarily not to reassure ourselves about the art that comes to us. Art is a fantastic and merely unlimited source and resource, also connecting to our topics. We have really to start with ourselves, with our very own places and spaces, with our very own narratives. Thank you. <laughs>